Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I have a very special guest. I have ex-Vivid contract star turned winemaker turned OnlyFans creator, Savannah Sampson, a.k.a. Natalie Oliveros. So, Savannah slash Natalie, what, what should I call you? Oh, that's such, you know, I always say, what is my name? Because I was born Natalie Lynette Skeldon, but uh, my married name is Natalie Oliveros, which I'm no longer married, but I wanted to keep my name. I wanted the same uh, name as my child. Um, And Savannah Sampson is a pseudonym. She's a part of me. She carries me. I carry her with me. Um, But I guess she's been described as just but a shadow of me. Um, So, I, I mean... Talking a lot about the adult industry, it's easier for me to be Savannah. I feel like Savannah's more fun, she's more free, she's more open, and more willing to be vulnerable and exposed. Um, like I try to keep, I try to keep it separate. I mean, I know I'm one in the same, um, but when I'm talking about my wine, I'm I'm Natalie. And when I'm talking about, you know, my OnlyFans or any kind of adult-related things, I'm Savannah. So I feel predominantly today we'll probably be talking about a lot of um, adult things and my my career in in that. And so we could we could be Savannah today. Okay, Savannah, I like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we talk a lot on this podcast about the duality of being a sex worker and like your personal life and your you know, career and how a lot of people feel like they have to keep it separate just because there's such a stigma around the adult industry. So the fact that you even come out and, and kind of tell people what your real name is and, and acknowledge that you publicly acknowledge that you have both sides, I think is, is really brave and unusual. Um, But let's go back and let's start off by talking about Savannah Sampson. In the early days, you were a vivid contract star back in the early 2000s, back when you know, being a contract star was a lot different um, than it is today. So kind of tell us what that era was like. What was it like to be a vivid contract star back in the early 2000s? Well, I'll tell you what, before I even made a movie, I went, um, so I, I signed the contract as a vivid girl. And I was one of the few vivid girls that had a passport. And uh, Vanity Fair was shooting the Hollywood Profiler. So I flew to Nice and shot at Elton John's house with <laughs> David LaChapelle what? for this of uh, the Hollywood Profiler um, edition with um, Jenna Jameson and um, Taylor Hayes. So we were wow. like the only that had this um, passport at the time with, sh- with David LaChapelle. I mean, talk about glamorous. It was it was a whirlwind. I did uh, the We Show about you know women entertainment tonight, all these things. So it was for me. It really was a glamorous thing. We, I was the star of my own movies, but shot on thirty five millimeter film. I mean, it was full scripted movies, um, and it was just all very very glamorous. And you know, I got to pick who I worked with. I think the, the really for me the only difference is between mainstream movies that you know when the kissing started the door stayed open mm. um, and and it was really uh really really exciting and and glamorous truly. what was what was perhaps your favorite movie that you made with vivid or do you have like a top 3 or something like that um well I guess the movie I'm most proud of would be the new devil and Miss Jones. Mm. I, I was a little petrified of the whole acting thing. I like, since I started, I, you know, I started taking acting classes and everything, but um, I kind of developed my own form, which is more like the Stella Adler technique because, you know, I'm not a sexually depressed, you know, playing Miss Jones. I wasn't a sexually depressed, you know, woman who, you know, takes her own life so I kind of wrote a whole backstory of what it would be like to be her and kind of became her and the things that I did in that movie like 
when we when we're in the hell there's this guy he's got uh, all in a mask he's got needles in his mouth he pulls the needle out and was like piercing the skin and then you take it out and the blood would drip down and eating fire and just like this in- incredible thing and the things that I did in that movie like for example during a dp scene so i had to do the original monologue that georgina spelvin does in the in the original movie and i learned the monologue and then paul thomas pt said no you have to do it during the scene and i'm like wait i have to do the monologue while i'm actually getting dp'd are you kidding me but i do <laughs> i do i thought it might be like you know what do you call it like a uh, recorded over over it. I said, no, no, you have a to voiceover, a voiceover. No. So I did that and it turned out to be quite an, an incredible, um, movie, but so many, I put so much into all my movies, like, um, looking in, I think was the first movie I won an AVN, you know, best actress for, uh, it was, I don't, I was like on cloud nine and I put so much into the script and, and, um, uh, what was the one movie also I love so much? Flasher, I guess. Um, Carol Alt played my mother. And it was just so fun to really dive into acting. I really loved that part of it. I know people probably fast forward through all that stuff. I'm not that naive. <laughs> but um, but I'll tell you now that, you know, we'll talk about that. I started my OnlyFans. But, you know, so many people, my fans, you know, my generation that still follow me which is amazing uh really enjoyed that part and missed that part so along the line I would like to incorporate some kind of little storylines in my uh in what I do with my OnlyFans but it's it's funny what you say about the acting part because you know I've shot a lot of features and a lot of the scenes that I shoot have a lot of dialogue or they might have some kind of um just cinematic intro. And that's what we spend all of our time on and our efforts mm-hmm. on. And that's like what we really, you know, um, put the blood, sweat and the tears into. And then like, once it gets to the sex, it's almost like everyone's like, okay, okay this is the easy part. Like, it's almost like the part that you kind of like, well, I mean, as a director, I know for the performer, it's not the easy part, but no, as the no, director, that was, that was the easy part. I'm like, they, they know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. No, literally Paul Thomas, like, okay, leave the room. There was no more direction. Yeah. You know, it was like, but, um, but she, she, LaRue, mm. she would really direct, spit on it, slap it, do this, do like, she was there really directing the sex. Yeah. In fact, in fact, in one movie it was Savannah Sampson's superstar. And so I, I had made a rule that I, you know, I always watching porn. And when there was a gangbang scene, I always, it felt to me like the girl was not, enjoying it that she was being degraded and so I said I wouldn't do more than two guys you know uh it was kind of my rule and then uh she she's like please Savannah you need to do six guys in this and I was like okay for you you know um but I get on the set I'm on my knees got all these guys around and I'm having a panic attack you know so I excuse excuse myself into the bathroom and I think after the third time I said, okay, you said you were going to do this scene. So either you can go out there and make it horrible and make it degrading, or you can step up to the plate and make it great. And so I went in, went back out there and I took control of the scene and it ends up being one of my, my favorite scenes. I also did one in um, 59 seconds, which was an underrated movie, but it's so good. The, uh, you know, the multiple guys, you know, gangbang scene, but it was because of the way I approached it and that, and especially what I had seen and for myself in the past, like, I really don't think that girl's enjoying it. And I felt bad for her a little bit and I didn't want to be that girl. So 59 seconds is another good, good movie. Yeah. You know, the, the gangbang thing is, is interesting and it can be complicated because yes, you're right. There's a lot of girls who do it because it's a lot of money and, you know, gangbangs are popular because they're 
it, they're really intense and they're kind of unusual. And so a lot of girls will do it just because it's a lot of money and they think that that's what they need to do to like step up their career to get like an AVN award or whatever it may be. But I've shot a few game pings in my career. I think I've only shot four and each one that I shot was ones where the female performer was shooting it for her own content and so she hired me so she was naturally in control of it so I shot one for Riley Reed I shot one for Joanna Angel mm-hmm. I shot one for Lisa Ann maybe I only shot three is there a fourth one I'm missing anyways um and those were fantastic They were so much fun because the woman was in charge. The woman chose all the performers. The woman very much directed and controlled the scene. And so rather than it being a situation where the girl, you know, is being degraded in a way that she doesn't like, because sometimes, you know, girls like being degraded, they enjoy it. But, you know, where there's a reluctance in the performer, the girls were very much all about it. And um, it actually was like some of the funnest shoots I've ever done, but it's all in the attitude and how you approach it. And the fact that, you know, you are doing it of your own free will and that you're setting your boundaries and they're being respected and, you know, everybody's a happy camper. Then they can be a blast to work on. Yes. But there's always in the couple that I've done, like somebody who feels left out. So I think one thing that I was a little bit gifted (laughs) was like, Oh, Christian, come here, come here, Christian. You know, because he's feeling left out. So he's got it in his hand. And he's like, I'm like, come here, baby. You know, (laughs) because you really need to incorporate everybody because it's easy to like get caught up in one moment. It's hard hard to concentrate on so many things going around you, you know? (laughs) Yeah. God, you're you're so right. It's funny. I, I always say that about blow bangs. You know, there's always like one guy who's like left out. He's like trying to creep his penis in. He's like, oh, oh, is she going to blow me? Oh, no. And then he gets like crowded out by the other stronger, more alpha performers. Yeah. And then like you see him try to creep back in and he gets crowded out. He's just like this sad guy, like, yeah. you know, trying to like work his dick in. And it's like, I always notice that one guy and then I have to watch him. And um. <laughs> So I'm glad that you that you you pick out the runt of the litter, so to speak, and you pay attention to him because that does Absolutely always happen. You have to. Because it's such a mental, like so difficult for a man mentally. And if the second that he may feel left out, imagine oh, there goes good wood, you know, and it's like, no, no, wait, baby. So then you have to spend a little bit more attention to those that are feeling a bit left out. So they don't get in their head. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. A lot of male performers that I've had on when I ask them about their first uh, performance, because, you know, I'm sure you get these DMs all the time, guys that want to enter the porn industry because they think it's like such an easy way to have sex with a hot chick and get paid for it. Um, But Mm -hmm. most of the time, the first scene you'll get cast in is a blow bang. And that's kind of to test your mettle, you know, because it's, it's not an easy place for a guy to be able to perform. There's a lot of other dudes around you, you know, you're not getting one-on-one attention, but you know, if you fail, which, you know, unfortunately so many newbies do because it's a job that very few guys can actually, um, be successful at, you don't really notice, you know, they can kind of fade into the background and it doesn't ruin the scene. Whereas if it's a one-on-one and you can't get wood, then the whole scene is destroyed. So, um, yeah, so for those of you guys who, you know, want What's to get a, in the porn industry and so think that the first scene you're going to do Oh, a blow bang? It's just it's a gangbang but it's just blow jobs. That's all. So much of the lingo I I'm like I have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's this there's there's, there's there, we have our own little language in the adult industry, that's for sure. <laughs> um Uh, Let's talk about your transition into mainstream. So you were one of the first, and I actually remember this vividly when this happened. You were one of the first porn stars to start your own successful side business, making wine. And I remember when that happened, I remember people talking about that and saying, yeah, Savannah Sampson started this wine business and it's actually doing really well. And she's won these awards. And I remember thinking, wow, you know, it is because so often you hear about girls trying to get out of the adult industry, do something else. And, you know, their career just comes back to haunt them or they just, you know, mm-hmm. can't make it in another sector. And and you did. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, like somebody 
you can actually transition into something else and you can be really successful at it and and how amazing that this woman is doing it. So tell us a little bit about that journey and the challenges that you face there. Well, I, I can tell you the moment I thought about, I was, I was dancing, like feature dancing in, um, I don't know, some club somewhere. And going down the stairs, I see all these posters of porn stars. And I said, who's that? And who's that? And then I met um, a couple, I won't mention names. Um, and I saw a fallen star. Like this girl was drinking so much. She's like, I'm going to make a comeback. It broke my heart. And I said, I don't want to ever be a fallen star. What can I do that my family can bank on in the future? Something that they can be proud of? Something that my son can... Um, can have for himself. And I thought, you know what, what better way than my love for wine. And I, I was traveling to Italy and France, discovering some not so well-known grapes and it could be very pretentious. You know, they're it's twirling wines and going, Ooh, currants. And I'm thinking to myself, old boots, my grandfather's boots. I'm thinking of gunpowder that I remember in my dad's room. I'm thinking about an ice cream cone or I'm thinking about blackbirds flying away, but I was always intimidated to say these things. And I said, one day I'm going to have my own winery, a place where people can come a little pick me up um, from all the pretension that is, is, could be out there. And it's one of those things like, well, be careful what you wish for. You know, someone asked me, where do you see yourself in five years? And I said, I'm going to have a winery in Italy and um, I'm going to make, you know, Brunello di Montecino. And sure enough, I have a winery in Italy and I make Brunello di Montecino. Um, it was a journey that just came full circle. I fell in love with Montecino the first time I ever visited. It was around this time. So around Memorial Day week. And it's beautiful, first of all, the rolling hills, the views, but there's an aroma in the air that you, you can't even imagine. It's like uh, the, the roads are lined with a weed called Ginestra, this yellow flower that just, it just smells so, so perfume in the air and the ingredients, like you can't make a bad dish. And then of course the wine. And I had such a strong feeling of I guess you call it deja vu, like of belonging. And, and then um, I was in France at Hermitage and I, um, I with another winemaker. And I thought, gosh, if one of these winemakers that I've come to know and love would agree to make a wine for me, I knew it would be great. So I asked one if he'd be willing to make a wine for me. And he said he would be honored to do so as long as I'm there, I'm tasting and blending and not just putting my name on it, which, you know, I wouldn't want it any other way. And so we, we started, my first wine was a blend of three grapes called Cesanese, Sangiovese and Montepulciano. And it was really, really represented who I was at the time. The Cesanese, there's a spiciness too. I said like the naughty side. And yet, there was an elegance to it. You know, my love for the arts and the ballet and opera uh, and then little tiny hints of chocolate undertones, you know, sometimes I'm sweet. Um, and it ended up getting a lot of attention. It was, it got a 91 rating from Robert Parker. And I said, okay, well, this could be a little business. Started this journey, went on to um, the south of Italy, um, the Campania region and made a Falangina called Sonio Due. The first one was Sonio Uno, Sonio Due. Went on to Piemonte and did Sonio Tre, so Third Dream. And that was 100% um, Barbera. And Barbera was one of the few feminine grapes, which I love that idea. And then I said, okay, it's time to find a Sonio Vero, a true dream. Because I didn't own anything. I would buy a portion of the vineyard for that vintage only. And the label, I do a different kind of pin, uh, pin up kind of uh, label. So as soon as I said it's time to find something that I could actually own, 
my true dream. Out of the blue, my original uh, winemaker called and said he wants, his partners want to sell La Fiorita, which was the first winery that I tried in Montalcino. And um, he was my winemaker also. He oversees a lot of different um, wineries. And, you know, I, I found my uh, my investor, my partner. And a week later, I was the proud owner of this incredible existing brand that started in 92. And suddenly, you know, my Sonio Vero line, I, I did make one last label. I felt like I needed to put an end to the story but I needed to concentrate on this brand because it was an existing brand. Um, and now, I mean, I just built a state-of-the-art winemaking facility. It's incredible. The wines are getting better and better. I have an incredible team, an incredible enologist and winemaker. And my uh, 2015 Brunello Reserva just got 97 wine spectator points, which is just really incredible. And my 2016 Brunello, a 95 wine spectator point. So my wine is really, it's, it's beautiful. It's going to just keep getting better as the vines get, get older and dig deeper to find the water and get all that minerality. Um, my new cantinas, state of the art, and just, uh, you know, with the sorting tables, a great team, a great partner who really believes in me and my vision. And the wines are just really going to keep getting better and better. Wow. And I mean, the way that you describe your wines and, um, I mean, you can see that there's like a real passion behind that. And, uh, it almost, I mean, I'm actually sober. I don't drink. A lot of people know that, but it, it, it's very enticing. And, um, mm. I mean, what, I mean, wow, what a very descriptive, like really, I can tell that this is something that you really love. So did you find that you had to hide your sex work career? Like, do you ever come across a situation where someone might recognize you when you're, you know, in some oh. kind of doing some kind of wine event, something like that. And then you have to like oh, yeah. backpedal, like have there been a struggle in that no. way at all? I never backpedaled. My, my career has always been open. However, for my team, it's a bit annoying. Like, so we go to Vin Italy and we have my, you know, the La Fiorita booth. And so many like people are just curious to see me, you know, and, and you know, and, uh, to sign a bottle or whatever. And they, and I, I understand like my wine is serious. It's really amazing stuff. Um, and yes, we would like, you know, wine buyers to come over and taste my wines and, you know, not just the people that want to, you know, talk to me or get an autograph. So I, I know it can be, there's not a whole lot of room for Savannah um, in these events. However, I have done many um, articles, magazines like Panorama. Yes, they want to talk about the wine, but the real story for them is, you know, like uh, X star Luch, you know, like, uh, um, you know, the Italian magazines, it's, it's a curiosity thing for sure, but I've never denied what I've done. I feel in my, that world, I can't really talk about it. Like, you know, when I have a memory, Oh, this reminds me of something I've, I have to hold myself back, you know, because, you know, some people in the past would get hurt if I mention it and I'm like, why can't I just have a memory without it being offensive to you. You know, it's just that part has been difficult for me that I had to stifle something I was so proud of. I mean, I was so proud of Savannah. I worked so hard and so hard to build the brand, my wine, and then just have to kind of pull back or felt I had to, to be good according to what societal you know, societal terms, what, what people, you know, what my partners might think I could hurt the brand. Of course, I understand that, that Savannah could be not, some people could not understand, you know, can see the very limited side of it instead of it as an art form, which I like to call it an art, an art form. 
an art form of entertainment, which is what I've always looked at it as. All right, everybody, we're going to take a quick commercial break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk a little bit more about Savannah's comeback, about um, being a mom and a sex worker and so much more. So hang tight. We'll be right back. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q and A's where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. Welcome back, everyone. Okay, so Savannah, you have recently come back into the industry. You started your own OnlyFans, of course, and you've even done a scene for browsers. So tell us a little bit about why you came back into the industry when you had a wine business that is still doing really well. So it wasn't really just about the money, right? Oh, no. No, no, no. In fact, when I did start the OnlyFans, I got so many messages from close people saying, is everything okay? Is, is your wine business okay? And it's like, wait, no, this is, OnlyFans was just something I needed to do for me. This past year, you know, with COVID and not being able to travel, um, I recently had a quite devastating breakup and went through my womanly change that, you know, no one can really prepare you for, still ongoing thing. Um, my friends would say, oh, I'm having a hot flash. I'm like, maybe you're just hot. But no, it's like something that no one ever really does warn you for. And I was, you know, very much alone and feeling down. And I wanted to start 2021 feeling like a woman. Uh, I wanted to feel the love and appreciation of my fans who I abandoned for so long. And I really did. I you know, I, my contract ended with Vivid and I, I didn't continue because I thought I would concentrate on raising a teenage child and my wine business uh, and really felt a part of me was being suppressed. And so I joined OnlyFans and it's incredible. It's been incredible. I, I, I didn't know I still had people, you know, fans and, um, it was a wonderful reception. I don't think I've ever felt so alive as a woman. And um, I did the browsers thing because, okay, I get all these messages from the fans. Oh, you need to shoot with this person or that person. And I said, well, wait, I'm not really back, back. I'm just doing OnlyFans. And then I got a message from Kieran Lee and uh, Sir Kieran Lee and saying all my fans, <laughs> all my fans are writing to me, you need to shoot with Savannah Sampson. And we had the conversation. And like I said before, I don't do anything half ass Like if I'm going to do it, I do it. And next thing I know, I'm on my way to go um, shoot this scene. And we, we shot a couple of things for my own, for our OnlyFans, and then shot for browsers. And well, quite a different experience than my vivid days. I bet. What I loved, yeah. <laughs> what I loved about vivid is, you know, the whole like, uh, you know, high featured films. Um, whereas this, 
I guess you're on set. Everyone's talking through the whole thing. Um, remember we talked about how with Vivid, like it, the director would kind of leave the room when the sex started because, you know, I would, we would just be natural and do our thing. With this, it was like, okay, you're, you start the scene, reverse cowgirl out because you have to get the guy in the window in the background. Um, there was one point where I, so the guy's going to come from behind and someone else is going to be talking to me. Savannah, is that you? And I, right when he puts it in, I'm like, <gasps> you know, have to be some kind of silly browser's moment. You have to do the, said, it's the browser's face. We all know it. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm so glad I keep, continue taking all my acting classes for this moment, you know? <laughs> Um, and of course they pair me with the youngest, you know, hottest guy ever, this Lucas Frost, you know, because I'm the MILF. Oh, so, I love Lucas. Like, he's great. I, he's great. He's really yeah. great. But, but for me always, you know, I chose who I worked with. Um, Kieran chose Lucas and I see this beautiful young guy who was doing yoga before the scene, but he didn't pay any attention to me. I mean, usually the foreplay <laughs> starts in the makeup room you know but there was none of that and then finally he came behind me and started like kissing my neck and said oh, how stunning I am and I was like oh to myself okay okay and maybe he actually notices me you know and then we have this beautiful scene um I don't I don't know if we would call it beautiful but um hot but it was so Okay, like at one point they said, okay, seven more minutes. I'm like, seven more minutes? And Lucas said, oh, is that too long? I'm like, no. Like, don't we say when the scene is over? But no, they say when the scene is over. So, you know, it was an experience. It was, it was great. I, I was a little, a little self-conscious, you know, my age and like, oh my gosh, who do I think I am coming back? Um, and also... I had a lot of makeup on, I felt like, and I'm like, oh, that makeup, so much makeup. Do I need so much makeup? But, you know, when it came out, it doesn't look like I have all that on, but, you know, the beauty of the camera work. Mm. And honestly, I felt a little something that I never felt previously. And it ha has to do probably with my little insecurities and things like this, but I felt a little bit like I was performing which I never felt like before working for really. I never felt like I was performing this. Uh, it was, um, performance awareness, you know, hmm. which, um, kind of like when I was at scores, when I used to dance at scores, I, you know, was just became Savannah and I never tried to make money. I made a shit ton of money, but I had my child and then I went back, you know, for a little bit and I felt that feeling of working it and that never works, you know? Mm -hmm. So I had a little bit of that feeling. Um, Do you think it was because you'd been out of the game for so long? Like it didn't yeah, feel kind of I'm weird to be back? Rusty. Maybe just rusty or uh, maybe... Um, the insecurity of, you know, someone said to me once, like, it's kind of pathetic, you know, you going back at this age. Um, you want people to remember you when you were at your best uh, and not and not be pathetic. But for me, in this moment in my life, like, maybe the number goes higher it's somehow less important. Um, like with my OnlyFans, I, I feel so free and alive and beautiful and sexy. I'm not having any of those hangups I had 10 years ago where of insecurity, you know? Mm. But for the scene, uh, yeah, I was very much aware of like, maybe also a little bit aware of like how it will be perceived. People will say, you know, like, who cares what people think? But yet, I've always cared about what people think, you know? Mm -hmm. And so... It we all do. A little bit on the forefront of my mind a bit. Yeah. God, I can relate to 
everything that you're saying, you know, I mean, I'm also, I'm 42 and, um, I started in OnlyFans and started modeling nude for it. Um, just like a couple years ago, you know? So I like, I was in this industry for, you know, 22 years and I decided to start modeling nude at 40. And I was yeah. like, why did, you know what I mean? Why didn't I do it when I was younger? And, you know, there's a whole long explanation as to how this came about, which a lot of my listeners know about, and I won't get into it now. But I have found that platforms like OnlyFans, where you have that direct connection with your fans, people who really care about you, and they're more interested about you, like, as uh, Savannah and Natalie together, not just Savannah, Mm -hmm. you know? And, And there's a real connection that you have with your fans that we never had before, these personal content platforms came along before when you were the vivid contract girl, you were this unattainable goddess on a box Mm -hmm. cover, you know, people couldn't really get to know you. And so you you never really had that direct interaction with your fans, except for maybe when you feature dance or did conventions. Mm -hmm. And so it's just so different now in the ability to be able to control your own content and to be able to produce what you want and have people respond in the way that they do has been really wonderful. And you know, for me as well, like so liberating. And I definitely, you know, have times where I feel like, what am I doing? I'm old, I'm fat, like, but you know, my fans are like, you're beautiful. And, and, and the way that it's helped me in my personal self-esteem, I think that it's helped me with aging in a way that like nothing else has. And it's been a really surprising, it's been a surprising result of it. And it sounds like you're definitely, experiencing the same thing. And I think that like, it's really helping us knock down these old ideas of like, you're too old to do porn and the whole ageist, um, you know, walls that we come up against. And I mean, you know, looking at you now, I can tell that you are, I can tell you right now, you're fucking stunning. You look amazing. Um, but we're our own worst critic. I get that. And how lovely it is to have a place where you can be safe to express yourself sexually and have this feedback, which just makes us feel so good about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And also on top of that, what I love so much about it is providing this, you know, platform for my fans to express themselves Mm. all there. Like so many, like they like cock, they like pussy. They can't express that in their everyday life, but it's free. It's safe with me, with my, with no judgment. And I love giving that gift of be who you are when I am not going to judge you. Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. I had this, um, so I, this, um, La Perla lingerie that I wore in uh, my first scene back with Kieran Lee. I got a message from a a man in Japan who wants to buy it. And I was like, oh, I really love that piece. But I was like, I wore it before. All right, you know, maybe I'll just sell it. So I, you know, charge a pretty penny for it. Uh, And when I went to send it, I forgot to get like a signature for it. And I said, oh, I'm never going to hear from from him again. Never going to, maybe he's going to get a charge back or something. So I wrote and said, look, you're my lingerie piece will arrive on Friday. Please let me know when you get it. I get this message back that says, I received your lingerie and your, uh, your photo and said, I'm wearing it and pleasuring myself. And I said, Oh my God, that's like so sweet. You know, (laughs) putting on my beautiful lingerie and pleasuring yourself. I was like, that's just great. You know, (laughs) It's great when you, when you can freely be like who you want to be, you know, we, we mm-hmm. spend so much time kink shaming in the society. It's yeah, you're right. And OnlyFans is a great platform for people to be able to talk about their personal fetishes. I have one guy who's really into cuckolding and he loves to send me these long, sometimes too long can, um, messages about why he loves cuckolding. And for him, it's actually more about, um, celebrating his woman, like seeing another man enjoy his woman, as opposed to the humiliating Mm. aspect that most cuckolding scenes are filmed with for him. It's like, it's, it's like being a chef and you make this amazing meal and you want other people to eat your meal because you're so proud of it. Like he kind of likens it to that. And I was like, wow, I never thought about 
cuckolding in that way, but what like a wonderful way to look at it. And that actually totally makes sense to me now that you've explained it in that way. Yeah. And I'll use that a step further for me is like, like how I feel when people, the room's full and they're all, the wine starts flowing and I watch people start laughing and having fun and that feeling of pride, you know, so I can understand, I can understand that aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah. So fun. Um, so let's talk about being a mother. Cause you've mentioned a couple of times that you, you have a son and I know that this is, you know, something that a lot of women in the sex work industry struggle with. Uh, how do I be a responsible parent and, and raise a child? Um, will they be teased for what I do for a living? So what has your experience been like? Well, from the beginning, poor kid, <laughs> You know, I would get these elaborate costumes for my feature dancing from uh, Jackie, the costume lady. And at one point, this box arrived, and it was a child's lawnmower kind of play thing. And my son was so excited, couldn't wait to open it. The babysitter was like, just wait, just wait. I'm like, what did they say? Can he open the box? I'm like, what did I order for it? for him. And so, so just wait till I get home. So I see this box, you know, with all the, the toy in it. Um, and finally I get home we open it and poof, all these pink feathers go popping out of it. I had a costume made this is an incredible costume of like, it was like a Dita Von Tees, pink boa, the hat with the rhinestones and all this. And I was like, Kino, I'm so sorry. Like, this is not, it, she just packed it in this toy, in this toy box. Oh, in you know? this toy box. So, oh my so God. Poor thing. <laughs> so of course oh, no. I had to go out and buy him the best, you know, lawnmower a child could have. <laughs> um, <laughs> but so many things. And when I started doing this, the OnlyFans, I got a lot of, oh, Poor somebody a little upset. So a poor kid. Blah, blah. And I and the truth is I had lengthy conversation saying, look, this is what I'm thinking about doing. You know, are you okay? Is it mom? You gotta, you know, do it, do what you gotta do. And we've always, I've always tried to have an open dialogue about, you know, sex, about you know, the internet and everything you see. And just because you may see it doesn't mean it's a way to behave and to please not to use it as a learning tool. Like mm. fa porn is fantasy. But what gives me pause is that young people see it and think like, this is how you're supposed to do it. You know, and I'm not supposed to behave instead of like learning on your own with the safety of a, a partner you're comfortable with and, and everything. So we do, I try to keep an open dialogue always um, with him. And these days, boy, do I need to have an open dialogue because this generation of not conforming to what society says is boy, girl, female, this, all this, you know, binary kids. And it's hard for us, our generation, to understand the they, them, and this, like, that's plural. It doesn't make sense. But mm -hmm. I'm trying to understand like how they don't conform to what society says it should be. And I, I have to admire it and learn from it. I have a lot, a lot to learn. But one beautiful thing that, that, um, so I have all these avian awards and I've always turned them around or I'll put like one of those uh, gold stars or silver star over the word sex. You yeah. Know, and I have them in my cabinet like this. And Lucina says, mom, why are your trophies all turned around? I said, well, so you and your friends don't see best anal gangbang, you know, or best, <laughs> you know, all girl sex scene. Like, oh, everybody knows anyway. So he starts turning them around. And as he's doing so, they're saying, Oh, best all girl sex scene with Jenna Jameson. Good for you, mom. Um, oh, best erotic actress in the world reward award, mom. And then, and then he says, 
best group sex scene. That means you're a team player. And he turned every one of my awards after all these years, I've had them, you know, put the other way. And I just think it's his way of telling me that he accepts me. I mean, all, all while growing up, I would try to give him sound bites, like, you know, have the conversation as I look, you know, some kids might say, oh, I saw your mom last night or, you know, tease him about his mom. I've always said, you know, you can't judge a child for what their parents do for a living and try to give sound bites. Oh, that's my crazy mother or, or something um, to be prepared because my whole uh, career was completely out there. I mean, Vivid used me for all the talk shows you can imagine. Mm. I guess I could articulate a bit. Um, and, you know, it was never a secret. Um, so I just think, you know, his father would wear my Savannah shirts, me lying on top of the city naked, you know. Um, it was never taboo or shameful in my family. Mm. And thank goodness, because the kind of relationship we have, you know, I ask him, you know, do you have a girl? Do you have a boy, a boyfriend? Do you have a girlfriend? And he he shares with me things. And I think if I did not have that kind of open uh, communication with him, then it would be a much different relationship. Yeah. Yeah. God, that's, that's a really beautiful story about the turning of the Avian Awards. Like in my head, I almost saw that like, as this like epiphany, this moment in a movie or something like that. I mean, what a, what an amazing experience. And it just happened not so long ago. Like, um, and commenting on each one, like he really read them and yeah. Why is this sticker over it? Like the sticker over the word sex, you know, like, Yeah. 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 But, you know, he sounds, I mean, he's he's old enough to know fully what you do. And um, obviously, you know, you guys have a close relationship. I mean, I always tell people, you know, my parents were always open and and honest about what they did for a living. When I was a child, it was kind of like, well, mom and dad make movies for grownups. That was kind of like, you know, when I was too young to really be explained what it was. And, Mm -hmm. And that was fine, you know, and that wasn't a lie. That was just as much information as I needed at the time. But I, you know, I always tell people, I think just try to be open and honest with your kids as as much as is acceptable for whatever age that they're at and just be like a good loving parent and your kids aren't going to really care. You know, all your children want to do is feel safe and loved. Right. You know, that's the most important thing. That's so. true. When, when he was super little, we went to uh, Madison Square Park and he said, mom, are all mothers like you? And I said, well, no, you know, and I went into a little bit about the kind of work that I do. And he said, oh, I just meant, do they like to sleep in in the morning? (laughs) (laughs) I was like, oh, yes, then all mothers are like me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's funny. You know, we think like it's this this existential kind of crisis question that he's got. And he's just like, no, I just, you know. I wasn't even thinking about that. Like we read too much into it. Oh my gosh. Well, Savannah, thank you so much. This has been such an amazing interview. Um, I'm so glad that we got a chance to connect. I've always admired you from afar, but I don't think we ever met back when you were performing. Vivid was a a company that I never worked for. And um, so I never really knew any of the contract stars, Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, yeah, you're, you're amazing. And, um, we're going to do a quick, uh, Q and a bonus for my Patreon members. A lot of my Patreon members were very excited to hear that Savannah was here today. So we're going to do a special Q and a and answer their questions, which you guys can get exclusively at my Patreon, which of course is patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered. Um, Savannah, can you tell everybody where they can find you online? Oh, yes. So, um, my, I'm on Instagram as one of my Savannah Sampson official, uh, no H in Savannah, S-A-V-A-N-N-A-S-A-M-S-O-N. Um, also on Twitter is the real Savannah and my only fans is OnlyFans slash Savannah Sampson, S-A-V-A-N-N-A, 
S A M S O N. And my um, my Natalie is Natalie underscore La Fiorita. I try to keep everything a little bit separate, so to really know me, it's kind of fun to follow all those elements. Right, you're a complex yeah. woman, just like yeah. your wines. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And you guys can follow me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. And yes, guys, I caved. I started a TikTok. I know I'm terribly embarrassed, but you should follow me there as well. TikTok.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered. I don't know what I'm doing, but um, come along for the ride because That's hey, why not? Again, Savannah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.